Welcome to part two in our ongoing series on joins inside of Azura, database joins, remote schema joins, all kinds of joins. Yugabyte is a database company, so what we do is uh, we are developing a distributed Postgres compliant SQL database. So think about a Postgres that can scale across multiple regions and zones in a cloud environment in your private data center. Right now, people want to be geo-distributed. They want to deploy mm -hmm. database, not only database deployment, but application. The application here needs to be geo-distributed so that you can survive multi-user zone level outages or region level outages. That's why at Yugabyte right now, we pay a lot of attention and invest a lot at, let's say, multi-zone and multi-region deployments because that's what application developers, users, and customers are requesting from us. So I, I think that uh, Hasura is a reasonable and wonderful solution here. If you need to run federated queries, right, you have several databases and one database is analytical, another one is transactional. Well, you have just two different transactional databases, but they skip different slices of data. I mean, Hasura is like, as, as a Hasura developer, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's more than enough. Let's experiment, let's show, right? Alrighty, and welcome everybody to another data and API show. I am super excited to have you here today. And this is our second time into this uh, pre recorded format, which I got some feedback saying that people appreciated, well, the better use of their time, though apparently they enjoyed watching me squirm when things just would go off the rails. So, like, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm here to entertain. And entertain is my is my plan. I have brought on a guest to do just that today, Dennis Magda. It is great to have you join us today. Why don't you give everybody kind of a quick uh, rundown on who you are, what it is that you do, who you work for, and uh, and we're going to kind of jump right into this show because you've told me we've got a full a full load of uh, content to look at today. So, floor is yep, yours. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Hey everyone. Hey man. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm a head of developer relations at Yugabyte. Yugabyte is a database company. So what we do is uh, we are developing a distributed Postgres compliant SQL database. So think about a Postgres that can scale across multiple regions and zones in a cloud environment in your private data center. And you are getting, let's say, you're experiencing the same capabilities you have with vanilla Postgres. You know, you can create tables, you can run store procedures, you can do triggers and much more. But right now at fully global distributed scale and you can remain fault tolerant and highly available even if cloud zones or regions, you know, go down. So that's what we do. Speaking about myself, uh, I've been working with distributed applications and databases for half of my career. Uh, I came to Yugabyte from another uh, in-memory computing and database company, uh, Grid Gain. That company donated and contributed Apache Ignite. That's in-memory distributed database. So I would say that, uh, like throughout the last seven or eight plus years, I, all I do is I'm contributing to the to the databases. I'm building applications that use those distributed databases. And right now I'm excited, let's say, to be with Yugabyte and build cloud native applications that are distributed and resilient. So that's what I'm doing right now. Before that, I worked on the Java development team. I was one of the guys who was contributing and developing a GDK and GVM for embedded devices and microcontrollers. That's why I have a little a kind of a quite broad and deep understanding of, let's say, various technologies, let it be mobile, front end, let's say embedded and uh, like distributed uh, backends. So you got so, the you got the edge edge, like so you've, you're talking about embedded devices. So you're talking about the the hyper edge <laughs> of like the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the distributed technologies as well as then the geographical edge now for for databases and distributed computing where so if you've been doing this for about seven eight years from from how it feels as a user it feels like outages from services is actually on the rise like it's not actually something that's become more stable i feel like as it becomes more ubiquitous to have services it's more common to be like, oh, 
X service is down and it becomes really notable when services have that fault tolerant redundancy. Does this, does it seem like there's more like outages in independent uh, centers happening more frequently than, than before? Or what's, is that just my own personal feeling or from what's your experience being in this game? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a reasonable question. In my experience, when I joined my first database company and the first database community, Apache Ignite, that belongs to the Apache Software Foundation, those days, that was like five years ago, uh, architects and engineers, they were looking for distributed databases. People already used Cassandra and MongoDB was on the rise. It was not as popular as right now, but it was kind of one of the most actively developed databases. And those days when I was talking to uh, uh, like application developers and architects, they just wanted to have a scalable distributed database, the database that can scale beyond a single machine. Because before that you have Postgres, you have Oracle, you have IBM DB2, and usually you scale how? You just need to have one machine. If you need more resources, you have to upgrade to a more powerful machine. Your machine. And, yeah. The, and, yep, and, and those times when they were contributing, when I was contributing and using Apache Ignite, the primary requirement was, folks, we have a data center and we want to run a multi-node cluster so that we can, let's say, instead of running my database on a single like expensive exadata machine of Oracle, I want to run, let's say, across like 10, 50 or like 100 nodes cluster. And that's how people wanted to scale. That was, let's say, five or seven years ago. Right now, uh, what we see is that m m much more, like many more people move to the cloud. And uh, now we see that the cloud environments also fail. Even during the pandemic, like personally, I, I, I remember a few days when I was sitting, I live in the East Coast of the United States, I live in Florida. And I kind of experienced, I had a few days when I was launching some of my services and applications and they were not available because Amazon call, Amazon region was down. And it's like, because let's say the pressure, many more companies move to the cloud and it's inevitable mm -hmm. that more outages are gonna, be, uh, gonna happen. So that's why right now, in addition to kind of that basic uh, horizontal scalability that we expect from Cassandra, Apache Ignite, MongoDB, Redis, and other databases, right now people want to be geo-distributed. They want to deploy mm -hmm. database, not only database deployments, but application. The application tier needs to be geo-distributed so that you can survive multi-zone regions or even multi-zone like zone, zone, zone level outages or region level outages. That's why at Yugabyte right now we pay a lot of attention and invest a lot at, let's say, multi-zone and multi-region deployments, because that's what application developers, users, and customers are requesting from us. That's that's really great. So, so where Yugabyte really shines then is this auto-replication, if you will, and then and then I guess routing even. So it's not just about the the uh, typical Postgres, you know, setup. I've got my DB. I've got a replica, and then I can kind of uh, point to that as a redundant read source. Um, with Yugabyte, it's genuinely based like an intelligent uh, mesh of, of, of instances of, of Postgres compliant storage that will basically route my, my requests to different sources, whether I'm, because I'm, I'm in Germany, so closer to like Frankfurt for me, for example, uh, or for you, it'd be, you know, Virginia or whatever else it might be where I have my data mm -hmm. stored. Correct, correct. You're you you're you're absolutely correct. So, what's that latency is, like? And I'm, I guess we're, I guess we're going to see that today. I guess I'm part of the demo. What's that latency like for if I've if I've added, um, you know, an entry into uh, into my Frankfurt access point? What's the latency like uh, getting over to uh, to Virginia? I mean, it depends. It's a, it's a cloud specific, you know. Uh, and uh, for instance, when it comes to Google, if I'm not mistaken, there is a rather good cheat sheet. Uh, it might be, let's say, even less than a second, uh, because Google Google Cloud Platform actually has a really high speed uh, network, even that runs across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but anyway, like yeah, you're right. We will discuss in, uh, various multi-region deployments. Uh, that are supported by Yugabyte and some other, you know, new uh, distributed databases. But you already mentioned one of the typical multi-region deployments, the one with read replicas. And that one is supported by, let's say, vanilla Postgres. 
The issue with with, with read replicas is that with read replicas, if you take Amazon Aurora, that is basically also Postgres compliant database that uh, that is resilient, you have you always have one node that processes writes. So like you have that master node, if to put it this way. And read replicas keep the copy of the data that is on your master node. For, for many applications, that might be a suitable solution. Why not, right? Let's say my primary cluster is in Europe and I have a read replica in the United States and I have a read replica in Asia. Everyone is happy. But what happens if you outgrow the resources of your primary instance that runs Postgres? What happens? You need to scale to kind of to another virtual yeah. machine. And, at some point and that's down for keep... writes, right? Read replicas are yeah. only read. So not only yeah. does my, my insert have latency from, you know, if I'm in Tokyo and I'm trying to insert into something in Virginia, that's got latency. Uh, but then if like my, if I, if I have too many people inserting simultaneously, we're all, you know, ordering the latest NFT. Don't buy NFTs people. They're not, we don't do that here, but if, whatever the, whatever the storage is, right. So whatever we're doing, um, like it's actually, it could over, it could overrun the resources for that specific database. And in that case, I would have a complete downtime when I have to actually scale up the machine. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, many, many people, there is still sometimes you can hear and read that people don't treat a maintenance downtime as a downtime, but that's the downtime. Even if you need to stop, if you, if you need to shut down your application for an hour, plant outage, it's still an outage, right, for your customers. And uh, it's inevitable via, let's say, single node, single machine databases. So that's why, you know, right now we have distributed databases. We, we will discuss, again, to encourage our uh, attendees, those who are watching us right now, Let's talk about uh, multi-region deployment options a little bit later. Yeah. We will come to that phase because, yeah, read replicas are supported by Yuga, by DB, and we support some other, you know, multi-region deployment scenarios. But those are other schemes uh, yeah. advanced. Yeah, let's let's get to that kind of question a little bit later. Let's do it. Yeah. So show us show us what you got. This is fun for me. I get to learn and watch. I don't have to do any of the coding today. So uh, let's, next time, uh, let's next do time it. We'll <laughs> Next time I'm back on. Right. <laughs> yep, yep. So what I've got, what I've prepared for you folks. Uh, we created a simple application. Think about this. Think about this application as a hello world style uh, New York Stock Exchange. We have a special service running in PubNub. That service simulates different orders in the in the market. People come to a New York Stock Exchange that buys stocks and that information is needs to be recorded somewhere. So this service streams all the data, all the purchases, all the trades into my backend Java application. Today, this application will be running on my laptop, but uh, in the real world, you would make it cloud native and deploy in some cloud environment. Once all those trades are received, we will store them in the Postgres compliant database. Uh, I'm saying Postgres compliant because let's imagine that there is some real team, development team that owns this application. And initially they decided to select a vanilla Postgres. But then over the time they need to scale, they need to grow and they will be migrating to a Postgres compliant databases because they don't want to rewrite their source code from scratch. In addition to that, this development team exposes data through the Hasura API to your front end and mobile applications. We are not going to run, we are not going to have any front end or uh, mobile apps today, but uh, we certainly have to use Hasura. So like we, we are going to run a good uh, number of Hasura uh, requests to both Postgres and to Yuga by DB. So then let's start. Let's think about uh, day number one. The development team for this application is formed. You hired brilliant people. And you are creating this cloud native trading application that in our case simulates market orders. Based on our estimates, based on our capacity planning and some of the current requirements, we decided to use Postgres and we are we want to leave, we want to benefit from the cloud native managed services. So with our first deployment. Our database is going to be Postgres, but that's going to be a managed Postgres that is deployed in Google. So we selected Google SQL, SQL. Let me go there. That's my Google Cloud Platform account. And here, as you can see, that I'm running Postgres uh, 13th. 
And as a developer, I don't want to touch this database. I want to have, let's say, folks from Google managing, doing backups and upgrades for me. I just want what I want to get as a developer is just this connection string. That's what I need. And we've done this. So now the database is running, but the database, if you go to this uh, screen, it's empty. The application is not connected yet. All I have is the system level process database. So let's quickly go to our source code. So what I'm going to launch, again, day number one, the application is going to be primitive. So we are creating the table for buyers, people who buy stocks and actual deals, trades that are going to be stored in this table. Also, we are going to create a materialized view, especially for the Hasura API layer. I'll show you how that materialized, materialized view is used. And we will load, let's say, a few buyers, people who are lucky enough to use our uh, trading application sort of beta testers. So now let's, from the application standpoint, if you're familiar with Java, you know, it's it's all easy. We are going to use Hikari data source. I'm going to use uh, a Postgres compliant JDBC driver that is optimized. Uh, so first, yes, we are going to use for Postgres, where is it? That's my GCP templates. We are going to use PG simple data source for Postgres, my connection string, and that's the address of my database. Let's double check that that's the case. Yep, that's my address. So this application will connect to this database. Once connected, we will start this market order stream. The stream, we are going to connect to PubNap, and then we are going to receive, we will be receiving all these trades and we, will, we are going to insert these trades into my database. With the first deployment, that's going to be Google SQL, Managed Postgres. And also this application is going to run a special thread. Uh, every, let's say five seconds, we are going to connect to our database and get the current number of the current number of the trades. And also we are going to request what are the most popular stocks, symbols like, or tickers. What are the stocks? What are the most popular stocks? What people buy right now the most actually. So let's not wait, waste a minute. Let me start this application. So Just this app case. is read from the public data source and piping it in a GCP. Yeah, exactly. It's like a, it's a, it's simplistic... it's a rich person's ETL. Yeah. It's uh... yep, 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 yep. So the app is ready. Let me check the command. So right now I'm using this command. Let's start this app. So what happens here? We're starting just, you know, created app. We are using this connection properties. We are connecting to my Google SQL. I'm also requesting to load the schema. So we are creating sequences, we are creating tables. And uh, this parameter says that I want to print the statistics, like the number of trades and the most popular tickers every five seconds. So let me see if the connection is successful. And we have the first trades coming. And these are the most popular stocks, some line and cloth. We have Apple, we have Google, etc. So the, the information keeps keeps coming to my backend and this information is streamed to Google. Let's go to Google Cloud. I want to double check. I don't believe until I see it. Google Query Insights, if I do this for right now for the last hour. Yeah, we created the tables and right now we have inserts, we have selects. Also, if you go to the dashboard, let's see transactions per second for the last hour. Yeah, we have, you know, Postgres people. Yeah, we are writing, we have some data coming. So generally the connection is successful. Now, good. We are good. We have the backend, the backend connected to my <clears throat> Google SQL. But now what? We want to create front end. We want to create UI. We want to create mobile applications. I'm going to use Hasura. So I created Hasura project. Let me launch this console. And immediately let me quickly connect to my uh, database. So that's gonna be Postgres in Google Cloud Platform, GCP. Uh, I don't want, let's say, to write this connection string from scratch. Uh, let's 
speed things up. So again, we are connecting to my database. Wonderful. The source is ready. And folks, if you remember, if you want to query a table in Hasura using GraphQL, you have to track these tables. Also, we are going to track this view. Okay, fetch metadata. Okay, looks like we are good. And right now, let's let's see. We can uh, let's 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 read all the buyers. First name, ID, last name. Let's check. Okay, good. We retrieved all the buyers from the respective table. Also, what I prepared. Let's run a little bit more advanced queries. For instance, this one returns a total number of trades and proceeds. I mean, like how many, how much money was spent on the on on on, on stocks. I just copied this request. So we do this trade aggregate. Why it's not fine? Looks like trade um, uh, didn't get tracked on your data. You can also use uh, the yeah. track all button at the top in, as well, yeah. but yeah. You're right, you're right, you're right. Okay, now we have trade aggregates. Let's run. Okay, you see that we, we closed 708 deals and that's how much dollars we spent. All right, that's that's a lot, almost a half Good day. Yeah, good day. Good day for some and bad, bad day for others uh, <laughs> who missed this opportunity. So also, uh, you remember that we have a materialized view and what happens in that materialized view let me quickly show it to you this materialized view stores information about the top buyers people like first name and last name of people who spent the most on specific stocks and we keep this information in that view so let's use hasura right now to let's say query this information we can go what we can do. We can do top view buyers. Top buyers view aggregate, I guess. That's what I want. I want to aggregate. I want to get the number of... Ah, no, that's not what I want. I want to, to view these buyers. First and last name. And what was my query? Query to buyer's view. Yep, I want to order by proceeds. Proceeds, I mean the total number of money yeah. that was spent by the people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the query. Okay, you see that Anna spends the most. Then we have Sam, we have Patrick, and we have Lara. So that's the output. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Right now, our front-end and mobile applications can, uh, let's say, even query our views uh, that are created in uh, our policies complaint database. So that's it for now. Any any questions? Otherwise, there's no questions. <laughs> okay, it's all it's all simple. We all know that, right? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, this more... this is right. This is this is the basic model that most people are familiar with. Is we brought in a, a database. A, you know, robust Postgres database I've connected it. We're piping data in there, and we're exposing that through an API. Uh, so yeah, that's that's like where we're hopefully everybody is caught up on that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So from yeah. from here, what's uh, what's the what's the next phase? Because I'm guessing it has something to do with constrained resources. Yep. So right now, let's see. This application, this trading application gets, you know, momentum. And you've got a, your, your workload increased dramatically. We're not going to increase the workload in this, in our case, but imagine that your management team comes to you and says, hey guys, it's like something happens like with the performance guys, you need to scale. We are getting, let's say thousands and thousands new users daily. You need to scale. And like the, the engineering team kind of schedules a Zoom call and they decide what do we do next? Should we continue using Google SQL and let's say upgrade to much more powerful machines or should we pick something else? Generally in the short term, you feel like your guts feel that in the short term, you can continue upgrading to more, you can throw in more resources to your Google SQL engine. 
sometimes it can you know introduce downtimes because when you need to switch from one virtual machine with let's say five cpus to a virtual machine with 30 cpus your application might not be available so if there is one issue you will start introducing maintenance plant outages and your end users will be exposed and the second of all something suggests you that if the application you know popularity can kind of keeps its momentum then at some point in time you can hit the ceiling you will not be able to provision enough resources to keep all the information in a single instance of google sql and uh, probably you will not be able to get uh, the right number of cpus if you need to increase your compute power so and you decided to look at you know some other databases that are postgres compliant because you don't want to rewrite your code from scratch but those that are scalable those that are scalable that provide scalability for both reads and writes because you know that with uh many many postgres compliant databases such as google sql they support read replicas but read replicas are used if you need to scale reads and if you need to scale reads let's say in distant regions so right now this cluster is running in US Central. And if you need to have a replica, let's say in Asia or in Europe, so that your European or Asian customers can get faster access, you can do that. But the issue with the replicas is that you do not scale writes. And your primary instance of Postgres Google SQL can become easily your bottleneck. Because at some point in time in the future, you can run out of a disk memory or CPU or other resources. And in this case, you need a distributed database. So like at this step, you research the market and you decided to use Yuga by DB. And again, you don't want to deploy Yuga and Yuga by DB is a Postgres compliant distributed database that is transactional, that is resilient, and that is distributed. And when it comes to the distri distribution, it scales both reads and writes across your nodes. So you went ahead, you experimented with uh, yuga byte and you decided to deploy yuga byte in the cloud why because before that you used postgres like google sql managed postgres and you don't want to manage yuga byte db yourself you deploy it again also in google in us central region a three node cluster you have three nodes and uh, every node is running in a dedicated availability zone such as node three in us central 1c the next node is in U.S. Central A and etc. And, and these nodes case, are instances, was, right? They're they're individual database instances. Are these nodes? Correct, correct. Every yeah. every every node has its query layer that is hundred like almost almost hundred percent Postgres compliant, and we also have our own uh, storage layer. And every node keeps uh, a chunk of your data. And whenever you run your queries, depending on the data distribution, every node will be involved in the, in processing your requests and your operations, reads and writes. So with this deployment, you already achieved this, let's say, uh, multi-node distribution. And also if any of these zones goes down or any of these nodes goes down, your application will not be impacted because every node that has that you have here let's say this node can keep the primary information by about my account but also one of these nodes will keep a backup copy just in case right because if this node or this region goes down the other node will be able to pick up so like you are not losing any data and you don't have any downtimes let's do this the cluster is provisioned and now i want to connect to it Again, as a developer, all I want to have is a connection string. That's the address of my cluster, mm. and that's uh, the port number. So what do I need to do? Let me stop this application. During this upgrade from a Google SQL to Yugabyte DB, I, it's inevitable that at least I will have a short outage for my application while I'm switching. And the I'm The last going to downtime use... you'll ever have. Yep, yep, that's the plan. That's the plan. So Yuga by DB managed means that Yuga by DB that is managed uh, for you by our team. So that's my address. That's the port number. Uh, that's the database name, admin, and my password. When you create your database instance, you create your custom name and password. And also, it's impossible to connect to Yuga by DB managed instance, uh, you know, skipping SSL. So we are going to use 
uh, your unique certificate, my unique certificate to the database instance. But let's say from the source code perspective, I'm also going to use our version of the JDBC driver for Postgres that is a little bit more advanced. What it does when your application will be executing all those inserts and selects and updates and deletes, on the application side, that will that driver will know how the data is distributed. And if, let's say, this record needs to be inserted in node number three, then your application will connect to node number three directly. If another record needs to be queried from node number one and node number two, then the request from your application will go straight to those nodes. So that this way we can, you know, reduce the number of network hops between your application, your backend, and your uh, distributed mm. database. Mm. So let's do this. So right now, all I need to do is to update. I'm using the same application. I'm not recompiling the code. I don't have any, let's say, special switches in my code that say you go buy to Postgres. Uh, this repository is opened. If you don't believe me, you can check it later. Yugabyte, Yugabyte DB managed. I'm only using this properties file. Okay, we are connecting. The database was empty. You can, if you, when you migrate from Postgres or like MySQL or Oracle, you can use our tool that can migrate automatically data in schema. But this time we don't want to do this. I just want to connect and start, let's say, create this. Start database shoving data that way. Yeah. Yeah. So right now what happened again, PubNap streams all the trades into my backend and backend right now writes everything to Yugabyte managed. So let's go to Yugabyte. Let's confirm that's the case. If I go to the tables, let me refresh this screen. You see, reason writes. All these requests, all the inserts and reads and uh, whatever else my application does, everything is load balanced. Because all the data, all the trades, all the buyers accounts, they are sharded, they are partitioned across your database instance. If you want to see other metrics, uh, like performance metrics, you see that CPU, like we don't put that much pressure on the database right now, because the goal is just to demonstrate you that if you need more resources, if you want to scale reads and writes, you can get it with your distributed uh, SQL database. So good, uh, you achieved and right now you can, you know, scale. Let's say that in three months, uh, you need to get more resources, right? And you need to scale. What would you do with your Yugabyte DB managed? You go to the uh, settings screen, you click edit infrastructure button. And uh, so here is, yeah, here is you decide. You can scale vertically. Let's say you want to keep the number of nodes unchanged, but you want to uh, have, let's say, 80 CPUs, or how many, like 16 CPUs on every node. You just want to double, like triple uh, the number of your CPUs. Or if you need to get more nodes, if you need to get more like disks, like storage space, more memory, etc., you can increase the size of your cluster. So like this size. Let's say that you want to get more CPUs, you want to get more nodes. Let's confirm this. Let's start this infrastructure upgrade right now. And what's interesting, what you need to remember, even when you scale, whether you scale vertically with Yugabyte DB, when you're upgrading, let's say from virtual machines with two CPUs each, the virtual machines with six or eight CPUs each, or when you're upgrading to a six node cluster from three, three nodes cluster, Everything happens in a rolling upgrade fashion, meaning that we do an upgrade, or like first we upgrade one node, once it's upgraded, we upgrade the second one. We never stop and, you know, your entire, your database cluster. So this process will take, you know, some time. We're not going to wait while it finishes. You can see that the cluster is an upgrade, but what's important for me, the application developer, I want to make sure that the application is not impacted, you see? So right now I'm scaling, I'm upgrading and uh, the application keeps running. And let's say in 10 or 15 minutes, I don't know how fast, instead of a three node cluster with two CPUs on each node, I will get a six node cluster with four CPUs on every machine. So that's the beauty of distributed SQL databases. And again, also let's say this situation works in the reverse direction. 
if you're retail, everyone is aware about notorious Black Fridays or other sales days. If you need, like when you kind of boost your infrastructure resources, then if you want to scale down, if you want just to get a, like, if you want to decrease the number of nodes or CPUs, you can always do this with Yuga by DB. And also the experience will be the same. Congratulations. The development team, you know, just moved to a distributed, horizontally scalable Postgres compliant database. And whenever it's necessary, they will be able to scale out, scale up, scale in, scale down, etc. That's the first, you know, advantage of uh, Yuga by DB, horizontal scalability and distribution of your data and workloads. So what would be a, what would be a use case where what kind of what kind of workloads is Yugabyte not uh, designed for? I mean, because this sounds like everything's amazing, right? Like, like okay, why wouldn't you use Yugabyte? We do not. We're not. You know, we're not trying to be a silver bullet, like or not silver bullet. We're not trying to be a Swiss Army knife for everything. We don't do all that. If you're looking for, let's say, analytical, like advanced or complex analytics something that is supported by Snowflake or Google BigQuery or Amazon Redshift. We don't do this. Our storage engine is based on LSM, log structured merge trees. We don't support columnar store and we are not planning to do that. So right now, like I cannot speak for the entire company. I don't know, I don't know like what, what, what's going to be our roadmap, let's say in five or eight years from now, but in the foreseeable future, we are focused on OLTP. We are focused on transactional workloads. For instance, uh, one of, if, if you if to give you example, like payment systems or product catalogs or IoT, when you need to stream like data from your different devices and smart meters and analyze them, whenever you need global distributed consistency, whenever you need transactions at global distributed scale, and you want to use familiar Postgres compliant SQL, that's what we do. OLTP transactional workloads, no analytics. So that that probably makes a lot of sense then, because one of the things that we were talking about was where then this pairs well with some functionality of of Hasura, is that so you've got this idea where, you know, you you've got purpose made databases and solutions. So this idea of globally consistent and horizontally scalable reads and writes, like the the and writes is like the the oh, moment because it's just it's so powerful um but but maybe i do need for my bi team some analytics or maybe i do need for whatever reason i'm not taking all of my old gcp data and i need to be able to access that for archival reasons uh along with my data how would i be able to go about like connecting the the my migrated my transactional database i'm i'm, I'm sold <laughs> I, I love the the gigabyte i love that i have that for my transactional data how would i then join that with something like um my the gcp uh postgres that i had left in place or even with something that was like an analytics uh based uh db like where i could i could essentially slice out analytical data what would be what would be the next step there I mean, it's. Uh, I, I think that uh, Hasura is a reasonable and wonderful solution here. If you need to run federated queries, right? You have several databases, and one database is analytical, another one is transactional. Well, you have just two different transactional databases, but they keep different slices of data. I mean, Hasura is like as as a Hasura developer. I mean, it's it's, it's more than enough. Let's experiment. Let's show, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's have a look at it. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, let's let's see in action. You know, it's one 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 image is better than thousand words. Uh, Put the screen back on here. There we go. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I kind of let's go back to Hasura. Where is my console? Go to the data screen, and now first, basically, what we didn't we haven't done yet. We have this Yugabyte DB managed cluster running, but it's not attached to Hasura. We have to fix this SAP. So let me go to uh, to my cluster. And by the way, we have yeah we have we are natively integrated with Hasura, so I can easily uh, get a connection string for my Hasura. 
instance connect database let's call it yugabyte yugabyte just yugabyte db again the same postgres sql driver postgres compliant database uh that's my what i need to change i need to provide my custom password and uh, username and this is my password okay It's yeah, we can track one. this. We can track those tables yeah. there. Yeah, but be, but before we track, let's say if I try to track this one, Hasura will complain that we already tracked mm. this one, right? We have the mm -hmm. same one. So I have a workaround, folks. Let's say that we no longer use Google SQL. Our development team switched to Yugabyte DB. So that's why. But I I need to have some data. Let me do this for my Postgres database. Let's introduce the following changes. I will rename the trades table to trade legacy because the legacy data is stored there. Uh, same for the buyer table and I no longer need this materialized view. Let's do this. Renamed. And right now, when we decide to track Yugabyte DB tables, you're ready to do that? One, two, three. Yeah, uh, let's track them. Now I will follow your advice and I will click the track all button. Good. Uh, this issue materialized you. I've already <laughs> filed the bug, but unfortunately our engineering team was not able to fix it and release a new version uh, right. so fast. Not yet. It's uh, It'll be there. It'll be there. Yeah. So let's check. Yeah, I guess everything is tracked right now. Yeah. And then All we need to good. track the relate track the relationships too. Yeah, but that's that's the only thing. Yeah, we will do this. We will do this. Right now, let, let's say just let's do a sanity check. You remember when we used uh Google SQL? That was one of the queries that returns uh top buyers, people who buy most of the stocks. Let's execute it right now. But right now we are running it against Yugabyte DB. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Which means that from you, for your front end and mobile application, also no changes, the same experience. You're getting the same data from the same Postgres compliant database, but that is scalable. But I want to join data because let's say that someone comes from the management and says, look, I know that like for some reason, when we were migrating to Yugabyte DB, we decided not to migrate the data from Google SQL, but right now I need to kind of build a report. I need to merge join trades from like previous year with trades that we store in Yuga by DB. And I want this feature to be available in my front end application. Guys, do something. Yeah. And you kind of, you know, GraphQL, you know, like Hasura, it's easy to do. You can do the join. Uh, but to do this join, first we need to uh, create a relation between two tables. So between two databases. So generally, what I want to return, my report, what that report is going to return, it wants to latest trades for a specific user. Yeah, I want to get an information, all the trades that were done by a specific user ID. It's like across the past, legacy database could, and the new and, and the new um, gigabyte. Yeah, right, right. That's what you want to do. But before you execute this query, you need to kind of Glue together connect. your legacy database. Yep, connect or, or join the, them, the, if you will. <laughs> uh huh. You're right. So let's let's pick these buyers, and I need to do this relations uh, remote. We are adding remote database relation relationship type. I want to return array of the traits for a specific buyer, and the relation name. I don't know legacy rates reference source postgres gcp google sql and we are joining with trade legacy table in google sql and the join columns will be my buyer id and buyer id column on the google sql side in the trades table let's save it 
Good. You see? So right now, both databases are connected and we are returning to our uh, console. So where is it? We want to... Did you have that, that query written in, in, the, in your documentation or? Yeah, I have it. I just, you know, wanted to. I, I mean, can, we can kind of, I just. Explore is like fun I, too. Yeah. I, yeah, because that's what, I, well, that's what I love. I mean, let's just click. It's like the click experience where, let's say, it, it's a little bit more time uh, where ID equal, you know, let's say sum. And for that user, I want to return all the legacy traits uh that are stored in uh, google so guys it's easy you know you just click uh bit price and i want to have the same but for my current trades where are those and the current trades legacy trades did we uh do we track those from buyer to uh, traits. I don't think we track those relationships on the schema. If you go back to the data table, I, I don't think we track the relationship. If you go back to the data table, a uh, tab. Oh, don't tell and me you, uh, to Yeah, so untracked uh, foreign key relationships, we gotta track the... Uh... Okay, we'll fix it. it what's, it, uh, what's it complaining about if we have a look there? No, it's fine. Good. Yeah. No, go on. It's fine. It's fine. So right now, where is it? Where is it? My yeah, here it is. There, there it is. Yeah. 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 Good. 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 We solved it. You know, live, live troubleshooting. But that's how software is being built. After over a year, uh, sir, I now know how to track tables. Is uh, that's how far I've gotten? So, uh -huh. okay. All right, folks. But I'm, got but I'm good at it. <laughs> Okay, we executed this query, and actually, what this query does it joins data. So these traits are coming from our legacy database, Google SQL, and these traits are coming from uh, Yugabyte. So right now, if I keep refreshing, keep running this query, you will see that this number will remain unchanged because the application no longer connected to Google SQL, but uh, the data in uh, in uh, Yugabyte DB keeps changing because the application is still running. And like, that's such a powerful tool to have in your toolbox. So this, I mean, this is the, this is the migration story, right? So you're able to, to quickly spin up a, a Yugabyte instance. And if you'd use the tools or whatever, you could also migrate some of the data, but you, you can spin up a new Yugabyte instance, maybe do some schema cleaning or whatever you wanted to do. And, and it's like you've learned from your previous schema, you said, okay, we wanted, we're going to do it right this time or whatever. So you, you, uh, you set up your new schema and you've now switched over your, your, your uh, ETL tool that you have in Java there. So now you're piping data into the new system and you essentially are able to bring in the, the query, the same two databases simultaneously in a service. Let's say your application is reading from these two. You run a couple of rename uh, commands to basically now say all of the, all of my queries that were going to the old system now go to the new system as you're able to verify that all this data is working. And then what you're able to do is say, and then we, we still need is to be able to bring in the legacy data for any particular reason and be able to join that and be able to, to actually have these two databases working together for analytics or something else. So for a, for a migration story, like that's really, really, really powerful. Um, and I think that's a, that's a cool feature. So you get all the benefits of the new stuff without having to actually uh, walk away from what you had initially um, had worked on or, or all the data that you'd built up over the number of years that you know bi teams or whoever else needs to leverage for product decisions down the road that's a that's a really really powerful tool to have at your disposal is these these database to database joins as we call them um and and allows you to choose databases that are designed to solve the problems you're facing because if it was always having to choose the same database you'd be like well okay you know, we could throw another Postgres database and create a join or whatever, but like, like just, just take a, a system, a database designed to solve this problem 
of horizontally scalable, you know, geographic rights, like wherever, you know, rights in Tokyo, rights in, in Frankfurt, rights in Oregon, whatever, like get all that benefit and then be able to actually uh, still have access to all your old data in the same APIs and the same systems that you're shipping to your developers, provision, per permissions, all that kind of stuff that you're, that you're used to. And uh, yeah, that's really cool. That's a, that's a very powerful feature and where I think DB to uh, DB joins shines really well for that story. I think the other one was analytics. You were talking about a case where, you know, you guys don't do analytics. Like that's not what you doing is for analytics. Cause you don't need to have, geographic rights for dashboards that where your team is like based in Seattle or whatever. Like you don't need to have, mm -hmm. you know, a database that's able to take rights for, for that use case. So slice off a DB, like use Husser event triggers to write into time scale or whatever other time series flavored something or other big query, whatever you want join your IDs uh, from your primary, you know, Yugabyte database. I'm writing into Yugabyte into Hasura. As soon as I get an update on the table, I'm triggering an event to write off my, my analytics slice into BigQuery. And then I can actually use that join information to be able to actually get like the kind of superpowers that BigQuery surfaces or whatever else. And uh, yeah, that's You're a powerful right. story. Yes, uh yeah, so here is also kind of my personal advice to folks. I'm a proponent of purpose-built databases. That's how Amazon, like, because I, I remember that some time ago, I came across an article <clears throat> written by Amazon CTO, and he was sharing a story, like many, many Amazon users were asking, hey, Amazon, why don't you create a database that supports, let's say, analytics, uh, transactional, and let's say graph, time series out of the box. Why the heck you have so many different services? Like, why don't you have just one service? And uh, the Amazon says like, guys, I mean, it's like, what's, what's the point? Like, why would you create a, some like complicated piece of software that needs to do a lot? And that piece of software will not be able ever excel, let's say at one direction. If let's say you try to support everything, then most likely you will be able to do a little bit of analytics, a little bit of uh, transaction, a little bit of graph, but you will not be able to do those transaction analytical as good as typical analytical or typical uh, transaction databases do. So that's why this cloud environments, folks, it's like, it, it's so simple. Like even today we showed just, if you need something for analytical workloads, go and deploy analytical database alongside your transactional database. If you need graph, deploy your graph database. Whenever you need to query, whenever you need to run this cross database of federated queries, you have Hasura, right? Or if you prefer other tool, you have another tool. If you need to kind of switch, kind of send changes, you can always use change data capture and other mechanisms to synchronize those databases. It's all easy, it's all available to you. And all, also one other saying, you can erase this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or you can uh, kind of once, uh, like, uh, I had a conversation with, her, uh, with Oracle developer advocate, and he said that, hey, Dennis, you think that, like, if it was feasible to support a true HTAP database, like hybrid transaction analytical processing database that is as good as in analytics, as good as transactions, then Oracle would do this, but it's not economically, like, let's say, reasonable. And sometimes it's so problematic. So that's why, like, even Oracle didn't create the database. It probably doesn't make sense to do that at all. So, yeah, that's, that's my five. That's a good argument. If it's not been done by, we're getting to a point in the tech space where if it hasn't been done yet from a, from a hardware or technical perspective, there's a reason for it. And uh, if you want to, if you want to explore that space, definitely join R and D, and and we're happy to hear people who create wild and crazy things because like that's how we make progress but yeah that's um cool yeah i love i love that i love the integration here i love the fact that between um tools like like yugabyte tools like hasura we we've heard this before i'm not sure how much my management even likes this term um so this is just personal thoughts here uh but like tools that stay in their lane <laughs> where mm -hmm. it's like um Yugabyte is going to solve the horizontal scalable transactional database problem. Like 
reads and writes everywhere and and uh hyper hyper available like that's the that's the thing that yugo bite's solving for uh hasura is going to solve the you know unified access to that graphql apis for yugo bite um giving you joins for legacy databases or analytical databases to transactional like whatever your api access needs are and so this is where like tools that focus in on the problem space that they're trying to do. They're not trying to have a little bit of everything, you know, it's like, no, mm -hmm. they're doing the best, <laughs> you know, database work. We're doing the best API work and you can take these best of breed tools instead of trying to find something that does a little bit of everything, find, find tools that actually very, very specifically solve the problem that you need to have solved again, like with databases, like, don't get a database that does a little bit of everything. Get a database that solves the problem you have. And then if you need another database or another workload type, get a database for that. And like you said, use, use you know, change capture mechanisms to actually sync those. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that's really cool. That's a really powerful stack. And I'm actually going to have some more look at Yugabyte uh, personally. I talked with one of your, one of your other uh, reps at a recent cloud conference. And we were talking about uh, looking forward to when Yugabyte actually is, uh, runs on, I think it's, I think the limitation is on our, it's not on ARM architecture or it's not on, uh, we were talking about the idea of federated Raspberry Pis running a globally uh, distributed uh, Yugabyte cluster. Uh, but that was, that was. Well, it might be, it might. I, mean, I, I know that we are about to release support for Amazon. Uh, what's the Amazon CPU name? I, I, I forgot. Actually, uh, the one that oh, is yeah. based, I, I don't remember, sorry. Yeah, well, anyway, that, yes, that so... comes around, and in theory, that could actually lead to a support for at least some some uh, compute module uh, distribution where you get to have, like, gigabyte clusters on your desktop, which is probably yeah. useless, yeah. but sounds really cool. But, so. uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but generally, generally speaking, you know, like, it might be the issue of, uh, of Raspberry Pi because that, that runs, yeah, special ARM. There are no issues with, but my, but I whenever I need, I'm using Mac, and that's uh, the, the uh, one of the last generations. M1 uh, Apple, or M2 or whatever. M1. Yeah. It, it it works like I, whenever I need to to start Yugabyte DB on my machine, I mean it's fine. So M1 is supported. It's probably you know something related to Raspberry when the architecture of our mm. will be different mm. from what we have on uh, desktops. But anyway, cool stuff. So. Uh, we 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 uh, see that we are running out of time. But let, what, what if I like? Let me just you know five ten minutes. I will show the last demos, and then uh, yeah, let's I do it. I want you guys to demonstrate. Yeah, I want to demonstrate you. Let's say failures and outages because it's it's good. Let's that yeah, let's that, let's let you go by flexed for just a minute here, and uh, and we'll we'll see how that works. Let me put your screen back on on here, and uh, yeah. By the way, by the way, yeah. While we are discussing right all those. Uh, uh, stories in different use cases. Our cluster successfully scaled from three nodes to six nodes. So right now you see that we have six nodes running. Let's refresh here. Right now I want to see yeah the workload. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah from time to time because I'm not I'm not inserting a huge number of trades. So that's why you know sometimes there are going to be zeros because data yeah, is not it's mapped distributed and it doesn't. You ran out of things to distribute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like uh, it's always, let's say every node is involved if you keep refreshing, and sometimes it depends on how fast PubNub streams data to me. But that's like the the story. You saw yeah. that you upgraded live, and if not the PubNub, then I mean. But at least your application was good, right? Your application, yeah, yeah, your yeah, database yeah. architecture was running, so PubNub was like let us down a little bit. But anyway, so let, let's right now quickly simulate a zone level outage. So yeah. here is, I cannot do this because that's a managed service and I cannot, <laughs> let's say, touch these nodes. All I can do with this don't let the developer advocate uh, take down uh, take down production nodes. Interesting. Uh, I'm like, I, I will be fired and I will be, like, let's say, p penalized uh, for that. So that's why, but Yugabyte has a different product that that's called Yugabyte Anywhere. So generally with that Yugabyte Anywhere, again, you can deploy your cluster whenever you like. And uh, then, but you will be managing the cluster. You will be upgrading mm. your uh, database machines. You will be upgrading your servers. So basically you need to have your own DBA, so DevOps uh, on the team. But with this thing, I can easily simulate out. Here you so can break have, things, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I like. 
So what I tried to reproduce, I deployed the primary cluster in my, uh, one of my availability in, in, in the United States. And uh, also I deployed read replicas. So probably before we break things, let me show you another use case because in the beginning we were talking about multi-region deployments. Let's, let's, mm. let's put it this way. Your, again, your super like trading application is so amazingly kind of popular that right now you have customers across the globe and the management asks you to improve read latency for your user base in Asia and Europe. And here is Yugabyte DB provides several options when it comes to multi-region deployments. Uh, let me quickly show to this article. I explained those deployments that are used by our customers by taking Slack like corporate messenger as an example. So if you guys are interested, you can read it later, but uh, I have mm. nice pictures here. One of their like most, one of the unique multi-region deployment options is when you have a single cluster. A single cluster is stretched across the continents, but in every region, you have dedicated nodes that keep data for customers that are from the same region. And uh, whenever you, let's say, insert your records into such just geo-distributed database, based on the value of your partitioning column, which is the country column in this case, a record will be either stored in Europe, Asia, or America. For instance, mm. if you're inserting trades for customers from US and Canada, those trades will be stored in Americas. If you have customers in Asia, those customers' data records and trades will be stored in that region. The beauty here is that whenever you will, you can have a microservice instances or Hasura uh, instances running in every region. And let's say Hasura can, can, can get connected to every kind of node from a specific region and you can have fast writes and reads. So this deployment is for fast reads and writes when you need that. And this deployment is for the cases when you need to run, let's say, cross-region queries when you let's say, need to merge data between for trades in Asia and in Europe. But we're not going to do this today. Another option that is quite widespread is when you have the primary cluster that processes reads and writes, but you have read replicas. And you're familiar with read replicas, right? We use read replicas uh, with uh, standard and uh, vanilla databases. We are going to demonstrate this one today uh, for you, DB. Another one is when you have standalone clusters, different clusters, dedicated clusters running in every region. And between those clusters, if you like, you want to have a synchronous replication. So mm -hmm. that's, those mm -hmm. are options. So let's check this option first. I want to show you read replicas. Uh, I will connect to what I'm going to do right now. I will connect from my laptop. I will open a SSH connection a to this machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the tunnel. I will connect to this machine, and from this machine, I will show you how you can improve the speed of uh, reads for the customers living in this region. Uh, first, uh, let me restart my application because right now this application is going to connect to a different cluster. Mm -hmm. Let me. We're going to switch it to the the anywhere model now. Uh, anywhere connection yeah. now, right? Yeah, that's the anywhere like different. Let's yeah. say connection string and right now so here is also i'm showing additional endpoints so like my driver my driver will be load balancing requests so for instance if the data that i'm inserting resides on this node the driver the application will connect to this node directly so we don't do mm. this with yuga by db managed it's all transparent but with yuga by db anywhere you do this you define in your application uh, this additional endpoint we connect it yeah the data, the data is coming. If you go quickly to Yugabyte DB anywhere, go to the nodes, you see read writes. Okay, mm -hmm. good. We are here. So now, quickly connecting to to that node, we need to open the tunnel. Uh, uh, just connecting. So I'm on one machine and from that machine, I need to connect to, to Asia, right? We are going to Asia. That's, that's the machine that is in Asia. Mm -hmm. Let's connect. I copy this connection stream. All right. I'm there. So now 
I need to, I want to open a, a SQL connection using our uh, UY, USQL SH tool. SQL SH and uh, the IP address of this node is this, it's internal IP address. Come on, did it connect? What's the password? Quickly find this password. Yep, that's my password. Yeah, so like why it takes, uh, you know, so much time because like we have the concept of masters whenever you connect to your database for the first time or you execute uh, DDL statements, uh, the request will go to the master nodes and those master nodes are deployed only in your, in our, primary region in the United States. Mm. So that's why it took so, so much time. But now we are connected. Uh, that's my Asian read replica. And uh, so here is, let's execute this query. So right now, even though I'm connecting to this read replica, if I execute this query that returns me the most popular stocks, it still will go to the primary cluster to execute it. Because in Yuga by DB, you need to run a special operation kind of to allow read probably a little bit stale data from your read replicas. Let's do the timing. So now if I keep executing, so generally it takes how much? Around a half a second, right? And this data is read from the primary cluster. But if I execute these two commands, I will allow this connection, this uh, terminal session to read data from this read replica. So I allowed that. And now if you read, you see, huh. just six milliseconds, six versus, and that's the beauty of read replicas. We are requesting from Azure. And if you keep doing this, let's check the numbers. You see, the data keeps changing. So yeah. basically all the data, the application, just to, to make sure the guides, the guides, the guys follow me because there is a little bit of kind of SQL. All the application, all the writes go to the primary cluster. It's in the United States. But mm -hmm. then the changes are asynchronously replicated to the read replicas in Europe and in Asia. And you can see that the replication works really well. Here is my connection tunnel on the Asia side, and it's good. It's running. Right. And we improve the performance dramatically from half a second to six milliseconds. That is a crazy upgrade for a user to, for one request to be going from yeah. f half a second to six milliseconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And right now, let's say for this application, that's more than enough. If you decide, let's say, to uh, want to scale writes and reads across the globe, you can deploy that, let's say, geo distributed cluster when you will be inserted and you can introduce a special partitioning column. Based on the value of that partitioning column, the reads and writes will be processed by a specific data center. So it's mm -hmm. it's easy to do in Yuga by DB. That's something that is not supported by managed Postgres databases that support read replicas. We do like much yeah. more in this direction. And finally, man, let's finish this conversation. Let's kind of break. Now let's break bit. something finally, yeah. <laughs> Yep. So just in case, let's go back to our application. That's my application. The application is connected to Yuga by DB anywhere. So I will, let me go to Google console. My virtual machines. And we're taking down one of these provisioned instances that you have connected yeah. to Yuga by anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Let's say that, uh, Bad day, finally, you know, came and one of these availability zones went down. So we cannot kill this availability zone. We don't work for Google. Nobody will do this, but we can simulate the outage of this zone by stopping this node because that's the only node that's run, that runs in this zone. Let's yeah. stop this node. 
Okay, we just did this in Google console. If you go to Yuga by DB anywhere, within let's say like three or five or 10 seconds, uh, the cluster will detect that this node is no longer available. Let's wait. It's unreachable. There it goes, now it's Google, down, yeah. Google mm -hmm. stop. But what we did see though was when you killed it, killed it. We did see that the app that Yugabyte stopped trying to send data to it. We saw that that the distributed uh, writes and reads actually ended uh, to that node. And so that that was yep. definitely part of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because like the cluster is still available, and it's basically yeah. You are right. Yeah, I think that. We were not able to see their reads, like that statistics, but the, the, the writes kept coming. So generally the cluster was available. There were no any kind of uh, outages. It's only kind of I as a developer made a dis mistake and forgot to update, yeah, forgot yeah, yeah. to process yeah, yeah. Uh, an exception. We, but anyway, that's guys how it works. <laughs> yeah. No, then that's that... if you recover, you're not. Good. Yeah, if, if you want to recover this node, you just return it back to the cluster and let's say at some point in, in a few, let's, in a minute or so, this node will, be, will get back to cluster and uh, you will restore mm -hmm. your capacity. And that's how you can simulate, right, your cloud vendor fixed, you know, the issues in that availability zone. And right now your availability zone is up and running. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's, a, that's a very powerful stack. And I mean... Obviously, you can buy anywhere really great, especially for people that maybe have their own hardware and infrastructure and, and or for various compliance reasons need to maintain their own hardware. Um, so obviously, there's there's more to handle here and having to write your own drivers to be able to connect to the pool and blah, blah, blah. But uh, but it's still, it's great to see that as an option and be able to have that same redundancy for your own hardware setup. And then if you're like, going to go full cloud native then obviously the managed yugabyte instance you can you can even just see here where that provides a, a big value so if you're if read and writes distributed globally is something that your application really needs which kind of covers most everybody um like that is a great great solution to actually bring in for solving that problem inside of azura and then if you again need some of the additional database functionalities like analytics or wide table or time series or whatever then bring that to the party too and actually be able to get both for your development teams using using tools like azura to connect it so well, Dennis, I really appreciate you uh, you coming on the show today. I think uh, I think we give everybody probably more than their fair share of things to chew on and process from today's show. Um, any last comments or or thoughts or resources you want to point anybody to? You, you saw the D Zone article. Anything else, or where to, where can they find you on Twitter? Or what's the what's the best way to find you? Yeah, I think yeah, the one of the best ways. To find me and to bug me, you can find me on Twitter. You know, just Dennis Magda. Just find me there. Or also, you can join our Slack community, YugaByteDB. I also not a stranger there. If you have any questions related to YugaByte, and also I just want you guys to wish luck building cloud native applications. And remember, when you build those applications, also you have to remain resilient and distributed. And uh, Think about Yuga by DB if the time, whenever the time comes. Okay. But as always, I'm not pushing you to Yuga by. I just showed you how it works. But uh, use the resources that you need right now. You are good to start with Vanilla Postgres. And then when the time comes, you can always easily migrate to Yuga by because Yuga by DB is based on the Postgres source code. So good luck building cloud native applications. And then come and post in the channels what you built because we always love seeing the actual things that you build and uh, and love uh, hearing the story. So that is going to do it for today's show. Again, really appreciate Dennis coming on and we will see you all on the next show where we will be looking at more joins uh, following on our, our monthly series of joins. Today we've had database to database. We'll be doing a database to remote schema or remote schema database, one of those two for next show. And uh, yeah. We'll see y'all next time. Have a great one and happy building, everybody.